All right. So introduction to myself. I am Chris Dombreski. I go by Christopher Dombreski when I record audiobooks. Um, so it's one of those things that I kind of got into on the side because I've always, when I was younger, I always liked the idea of being a voiceover actor in like cartoons, video games, things like that. Um, but it was one of those things that you kind of realize unless you really pursue that, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so I put that on the back burner for the longest time. And then um, like several years back, uh, me and my friend Carl, we decided we we're going to do a podcast because you know, everyone's doing a podcast these days. Why not? So we decided to do a podcast about uh, video, uh, video games, board game stuff you play with friends. And, you know, to get that up and running, I decided, oh, I'm going to have to buy some equipment. And like, if we're going to put some money into this equipment, maybe there's something else I can do with it. And I actually had a guest on the show on my podcast named Hugh and Morton. Who was a voice actor and i asked him on there uh when i was interviewing him I was like oh how do you get into voice acting and he he told me a lot of little things there and there and got me interested and so i started looking into it um so of course the first thing you're going to need if you're going to be recording audiobooks uh I in, I independently record audiobooks in my spare time, so I have a home studio that I set up. Um, so that is the first thing that you have to worry about is your home studio setup. Um, so breaking it down, you have your recording space. That's the room in which you record in. I'm going to go over this in more detail. This is just the overview, so don't think I'm rushing through it or anything. So uh, you need like a PC or a Mac as your digital interface to do the editing and recording from. Uh, digital or analog interface. Uh, that's how you interface with the computer with your microphones. Uh, obviously, the microphone, very important part. If you don't have a microphone, you can't really record things. Uh, recording software, that's the software you use to do the recording, you do the editing and uh, post-processing, all that fun stuff. And of course, in your room, you're going to have sound treatments. In particular, uh, we'll go over that in detail, but it's just the treatments like acoustic paneling and whatnot. So first stop, the recording space. So most people, if they have it in their house, they think there's a what room could I make into a recording space? And the room that you don't think about if you happen to have one, a like largely, it doesn't even have to be, if it's a large enough closet that you can fit in it, it's great for recording. Uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, the person has set up a recording studio in their closet because the good thing about the clothes, even if there's clothes in the closet, that's gonna help uh, reduce room echo and noises like that because it will absorb the sounds. So if you have that space, you can hook up a microphone in it and you can record it, easy peasy. Uh, there's also, you can pretty much do it in any room. I personally, I just have my office that I have my computer in normally, and I just have some treatments that I can take up and down whenever I'm gonna record. Um, so, other option, if you wanna go the more expensive route, there's these things called isolation booths you can buy. They're like relatively like, like $3,000, $5,000, but it's essentially just a room that you would just put together somewhere in your house, go inside of it, close the door, record. <laughs> Um, but yeah, any space works good. You want to try to look for a space that is not going to produce too much noise, obviously. Uh, that's why closets are good because you shut the door. It's nice and quiet in there. Uh, but all right, so the next thing you're going to need, PC or, or Mac. Now, uh, typically the PC or Mac is going to have about 8 to 16 gigs of RAM. It's good for like sound editing. You don't need anything too powerful. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about sound editing, um, because as, unlike video processing, you don't need to have like a powerful processor or RAM or anything like that. Uh, obviously, your computer, you want to have a quiet fan if it's possible. That's why a lot of people prefer more to use laptops, because laptops tend to be quieter than like a tower, because towers have so many fans in them. And that kind of noise generated from the computer is going to sometimes pop up in your recording. Uh, and background noise and whatnot. Obviously, if you're going to be doing audio narration, having a large hard drive, like a terabyte or larger, is good to have. Because um, if you want to do the recording, it's best to do it when you do your recording. Your like core recording should be done in like WAV file format, which is uncompressed audio. And of course, when you get like a WAV file that's like an hour long, you'll see it's a very large file <laughs> because it's not compressed or anything like that. So you want that pure 
baseline before you do all your editing. Uh, and the sound card is only necessary if you're using an analog interface, which I'll go over in the next one when I talk about interfaces. Uh, but if you use a digital interface, sound card is not necessary because the digital interface will take care of that for you. Now, digital or analog interface. So I have up here uh, two different versions of things. So the digital interface, which is right here, I have. This is the one I use. This is a, uh, a Steinberg UR242. All it does is it connects to your computer with a USB cable. And then in the front, you have the ports for your microphones, if you're going to be using an XLR microphone. Uh, and obviously, you can adjust the gain right here for the mic, all that stuff. And this essentially will take the microphone, connect it to the computer to let it record into the sound software that you'll be using. Uh, the benefit of a digital is it connects with the USB, could be used on a PC Mac, no issues. Uh, does not require a sound card, as I said, because you don't really need a sound card when you're using that because that takes care of it for you. Good thing about digital is clean signal, no interference. Now, what I mean by that is a digital signal uh, doesn't usually have any issues with interference. But if you do like an analog recording, you can have some issues with that, which I'll get over when I get to the analog here. So analog, this is actually what I started out with when I first started. This is my old Mackie uh, sound mixer. I'm sure you've seen these in like DJ booths, things like that. Good thing about this is obviously I was using it originally for my podcast. So depending on how many people I had on my podcast at once, I would have a microphone for each of them. That's why I wanted to get something like this. And this lets you do all of the manual uh, like equalizing with all these knobs and whatnot, your highs and your lows. And obviously that is a whole nother thing to learn uh, when it comes to engineering uh, audio. And I, you know, I did it. And the problem I ran into originally is my house, apparently the wiring in it, very old. Um, so occasionally, depending on where like the cord was, it would introduce this like feedback humming noise into the recording because when you use analog, it's nice to be able to control things you know, manually like this, but you have that issue where it's just like anything analog. It's not shielded or anything like that. You're going to introduce this humming noise. It's kind of like a in the recording and you don't want that for sure. That's why digital interfaces are nice and clean. Also because of that, you don't have to worry about, uh, that issue. But if you do want to go that route, obviously it connects to the computer with an auxiliary cable, which I'm sure you've seen on like when you cook it up to your car, it's like that little 3.5 millimeter connection, which then connects into the sound card, which as you know, that's where you would plug in like your headphones or whatnot. Um, so you would need to have a sound card on your computer in order to use that functionality. Like I said, if you do go with an analog, you can run into issues if your wiring is older and not shielded properly. It can introduce some noise that you do not want. Um, so that is the basic interface that you're going to use to connect what's next, the microphones. Now when it comes to the microphones, there are lots of, you know, there's mainly two different types of microphones. There's the condenser and the dynamic. I will go over the differences between the two. Um, so first up, the condenser XLR. So the condenser microphone, as I have right here, this is the one I actually started with. Basic large cardioid microphone, looks like this. Connects to your interface with an XLR cable, which over here, all right. So it would connect to the microphone here. Just hold it a little lower for the- Little lower, sorry. Because of the camera. No, I get you, I know. <laughs> Gotta be aware. So you would hook it into that and whatever your interface is using, whether you're using your digital, you hook it in here or the, that was the analog. But, and the digital one here, you would hook it in here. And that is how it will interface into your computer because obviously your computer does not have to stick. <laughs> Um, so that is the basic now. A condenser microphone is a, one of my, I prefer to use a condenser microphone because it's it's got enhanced response sensitivity. 
What that means is it basically is very good at picking up all the subtleties of your voice, all the highs, the lows, the mid range. Like it's as closest to like the natural human voice as you're gonna get. Um, it reacts quickly to faint sound waves. So it's very, you can do, you can even like whisper into it, it'll pick you up perfectly. Um, so no need to shout into it. Um, so it picks up all the subtleties of a vocal performance, as I said. So if you're like whispering in scene or if you're speaking louder, it'll pick up all the changes. Now, one of the downsides with condensers is that it is very easy to pick up background noises because it's very sensitive. Now, I'll give you a story from when I first started recording. I lived in an apartment complex. And as you know, some apartment complexes, the walls are paper thin. And I was sitting down and I plugged in my microphone. I was doing my recording and I was listening to the playback later. And I'm sitting there like, what's that noise I'm hearing? It's like, it's a very familiar noise, but I couldn't quite place it. Cause it's like, I know, I know that noise, but I know it shouldn't be in my recording. And I like cranked up the volume and I was listening to it. And then I finally realized what it was. It was the sound of fork and knife scraping on a plate from the apartment above me. <laughs> so I'm just like, that's why I know the noise. Cause I'm very familiar with the noise, but it shouldn't be here. Cause I wasn't eating it. So, um, so obviously when it comes to using a condenser microphone, you got to make sure that when you set up your sound or your, your room for recording, it's very good. Uh, you cut down on room echo, all that other stuff, which I will obviously get into when I talk about treatment for the room. Um, and it needs what's called phantom power because these microphones, uh, they require a power source in order to function. Most of the devices have a phantom power source built into them. You'll see this thing right here. I don't know if you can see it. There's this button here that says plus 48 V. That's plus 48 volts of phantom power. So you push that button, gives these microphones the power they need to function because they need a little bit of juice in order to function properly. Um, so most interfaces have that option. This, this analog one has it. This digital one has it. Yeah, really don't have to worry too much about it. It's pretty standard. Um, all right, examples of a condenser microphone. I personally use the, the Neumann. These are very good top of the line microphones, but obviously they're much more costly. I think this one, this is the one I actually use myself that I have pictured here. It is the, the black one towards the top. I think it's about, runs about 1500. Uh, so obviously if you're going to invest in it, you got to really look into that sort of thing of how much money you're willing to spend. Uh, there's the Rode NTLA-1. That's the silver one in the middle. Uh, that's also one that's very popularly used for voiceover narrations and whatnot. And then there's the Townsend Lab Sphere, which is pictured right there. Um, so there's just very, you know, obviously when it comes to microphones, it's going to really come down to personal preference and how much money you're willing to spend. Uh, the next one is called a dynamic XLR, also uses an XLR convention. Now, the thing with dynamic microphones are they're not as sensitive. They're more direct. It's kind of like similar to, you've probably seen them in most places, like when people have a microphone on their like podium, it's usually a dynamic microphone. Uh, it's pointed towards your voice. It doesn't pick up the stuff around the room, it's just what's straight ahead of it. Um, so because of that, it's more forgiving in less than stellar recording places. Uh, because it won't, like, it'll pick up background noise, but it won't be as sensitive. Like, if I was using that one in my apartment, I wouldn't have picked up the sound of knife and fork scraping on the apartment above me. Uh, Obviously, when you use this one, there's a little less detail in the captured recording. So like I, as I explained with the condenser microphones, it's, it's more, it's not, it doesn't capture as much of your voice as normally would. Uh, it's still a very good recording. I, a lot of like radio broadcast is used. They use dynamic when they record their voice over some radio. Uh, but most audiobook narrators tend to lean towards condenser microphones. Um, and um, it also does not need a phantom power supply. So in a situation like that, if your interface for some reason did not have phantom power, that's fine. The dynamic microphones don't need it. They function without it. So examples of that, 
The one at the top there, that is the Shure M7. That's actually the exact same microphone that we have in our recording studio available for use. Um, it's a dynamic microphone. The black one? Yeah, the black one. Yeah, that's that. The Shure is right there. Um, so that's the one we have available in our studio. Another one is the Electro Voice RE20. This is a very popular one that a lot of narrators also use. That's the one in the center there. That looks like it has all those different like speaker inputs around the brimming. <laughs> but uh, and then there's the Sennheiser, the Sennheiser MD four four one U, which is like that weird flat looking one at the bottom there. Um, <laughs> So dynamic is a good choice uh, if you don't have a very good recording setup, uh, like a studio setup, and you're worried about noise, it'll pick up less noise, but it'll really just focus on your voice and it'll still come out pretty good. Um, so the other type is uh, a USB condenser or dynamic. So when it comes to these microphones, they're the exact same things as the condenser microphones and the dynamic, but they connect to your computer directly um, to the computer itself with a USB cable, so you don't even need these interfaces. Uh, you would just use that, connect it directly USB to your computer, and it will capture the audio for you and record it into whatever software you're using. The good thing about these are they're much more budget friendly, uh, obviously, because you don't have to invest in a, an audio interface. You can just get the microphone and you're pretty much good to go once you have the microphone and the computer. So, like I said, they act as their own audio interface, so you don't require them. So examples of those, uh, the first one there, that is what's called the Blue Yeti. It's a very popular one that's used for podcasters. Uh, a lot of people who use, who do like streaming, they'll use those microphones too. Uh, the Blue Snowball is that little like round one in the middle. Uh, also a uh, condenser microphone. Uh, then there's the Elgato Wave 3. That one is, I believe, a dynamic, but I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. So like I said, the benefit of using these microphones is you don't have to worry about the audio interfaces. They go right to your computer and record into whatever software you're using, which brings us to our next part that you're gonna need recording software. So first and foremost, the most popular and easy to access recording software is Audacity. Audacity is a completely free open source software that you can download, relatively easy to use, that allows you to get your recording going without having to spend any money, which is good for people who are starting out. Um, there are plenty of things online about Audacity, like guides and whatnot, that'll help you learn the program and all the ins and outs of how to utilize it. The next one, which is the one I use personally, Adobe Audition. Uh, Adobe Audition is part of the Creative Cloud suite, so it requires an active subscription of $20.99 a month. Um, another thing, we offer Adobe Audition in our recording studio for people to use, so you don't have to worry about that if you come in and use that. You can use Adobe Audition without having to pay the subscription fee. Um, the next up is Pro Tools Artist. So Pro Tools is another uh, software that is used by a lot of voiceover artists. It comes in different tiers. The Pro Tools Artist is the lowest tier, which, because a lot more, as it gets more complicated, it's more for complicated things like, you know, recording music and stuff like that. So for voiceover, the artist is pretty good for that. Uh, requires an active subscription of $9.99 a month, or you could do 99 years for one year upfront. Uh, those are the options that they give for people to use. And if you are using a Mac instead of a PC, another option is GarageBand, which is a free software that is available on Macs, uh, which is very similar to Audacity, just built specifically for Macs. But Audacity can run on both Mac and PC, as all of these things can, um, except for GarageBand. That is specifically only Mac. <laughs> So this software is what you're going to be using to record your audio that you're going to be, uh, and the ones that's recorded, that's how you're going to get into the nitty gritty of engineering the audio. Um, but talk about that later. So the next up, sound treatments. So there are lots of different types of sound treatments you can use in a recording studio. I listed a few here. 
first one up is called a reflection filter. So that's kind of like what's depicted in the top left there, where you see it looks like kind of like when you did those presentations in high school where you had like the trifold board and you put that. So it goes around your microphone and has uh, audio treatment around it. So it kind of puts it in like a protective little cocoon. So when you're recording audio into the microphone, your audio is not going to bounce off the walls as much as it would normally, because that's one of the important things of the treatment. It's not about soundproofing so much as like, as you can hear me speaking now, the room has a bit of an echo. And when you're recording, you're going to get that room echo too, which is why you use these things to dampen the echo so you don't hear it. Um, so the reflection filter, that's a very simple piece of thing. You can just throw it on your desk or table, whatever you're using to record, put the microphone inside of it. And if you have a small enough space, that might be all you need uh, when it comes to like the treatments. Another option is acoustic foam panels. Those are the things you see, um, like when you put them up, like the sender picture there where you see like the paneling on the wall, that's like all these little foams with ridges on them. Those you can put up on your wall. You can get like a tack of 20 on Amazon relatively inexpensively. And then you have to like actually attach it to your wall, which some people, depending on what you're using as a recording space, they don't want to do that. Cause like, if it's like, for instance, something that you don't want to always have up, like if it's like, since it's my office at home, having those panels up on the wall all the time might not be appealing to look at all the time, but it, it's an option if you want to go that route. The route I do, the next one is the acoustic blanket, which I brought up here is actually right here. And I do with this acoustic blanket is I have hooks on the wall in my office and these things have these rivets in them. What I do is when I'm going to record, I just hang up, hang it up on the hooks that are screwed into the wall and the blanket drapes over the, you put it to the left wall, right wall and the back wall, just like you do with like that reflection filter because that's essentially where you want to block the echo from coming from because your voice is here. These are going to block the echo from bouncing back to the back end of the microphone. So I like this method because then, I mean, originally when I started, like I said, I was in an apartment, so I couldn't exactly put acoustic, acoustic paneling up because I don't think the landlord would appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so that's where I came up with this system where I actually used like those 3M hooks, like the damage free hooks, and I hung the blankets up on there. And four hooks like that on the wall, it held the blanket the entire time I lived in that apartment. Uh, I would take it down when I wasn't using it, put it back up when I was using it that way. And when I was leaving the apartment, I just took those off the wall, no damage to the wall whatsoever. So they really do work. Yeah. Yeah, they have different degrees of um, hooks, um, yeah. of like strength. I bought the highest strength ones you can get and put four of them because the blanket's pretty heavy, obviously. Um, and it did a really good job. None of them ever fell down. So, and I think I used it, I was in that apartment for like four years doing that. So that's a good option if you don't want to damage the wall or, but like I said, if you have, if you go with the recording space that's in your closet, a lot of that dampening is going to be done with like the clothes in your closet uh, and stuff like that. But these blankets are great for that. And I do like, cause in my desk, I have windows cause the front of the house is right here on the left. I drape this over the windows too. Makes the room very dark, but it does also help cut down on weird noise coming in from the street because it kind of, it blocks a little bit. It's like I said, it's not perfectly soundproof, but it does a good job of doing like the little subtle things that would pick up in your recording, like a dog barking or, you know, but obviously like someone mowing their lawn, not so much. <laughs> uh, so another thing uh, is a pop filter. Now these are actually pretty important. That's like that kind of like, circular net looking thing with like the band on it with like the clamp on the end. What that is, is you clamp it onto your microphone stand and you put it in front of your mic. What it does is it prevents too much when it comes to plosives and sibilance. So plosives, obviously when you say P, you see that and that air comes out. It, when you do that, it picks up in microphones very easily and can make it sound awful. So the pop filter helps if you can't really, because obviously if you're going to be doing audiobook narrative, you're going to work on your plosives and your siblings anyway. But just in case you're getting really into it and you're getting really into it and like some characters yelling and you're yelling too, and it just pops because you forgot about it. It helps to reduce that wind flowing into the microphone. So it doesn't uh, pop, uh, appear in the recording because of that. 
Uh, obviously, it's not a perfect system, but it helps for those little slip ups like that. Uh, and the last piece is a shock mount. Now that's that little cage looking thing on the bottom left there. That is actually what happens is the microphone gets planted inside of it and then that gets attached to your mic stand. The purpose of this is, as you know, like if you have a microphone and you have it in your hand, if you bump into it, you hear that noise. The, the shock mount absorbs the vibration. So if you bump into it, it'll stop it. It'll move the microphone with it, but it won't make that vibration noise. So if you do bump into it or you have to readjust it because you're not, you feel like it's not the right placement, it'll keep that noise from being recorded too often. So it's good to have, I have one on mine very kind of forget it's there after a while but it does a good job of what it does so that's pretty much all it comes down to when it comes to setting a, up a studio so the next question is audiobook narration for me well obviously you're here so you're interested in audiobook narration but there's a lot of things to consider when doing uh, independent audiobook narration that i'll go over now first up Independent narration can be very time consuming undertaking. Some people might not realize how much time and effort goes into recording audio books. Um, so obviously some books might be like eight hours long. So you're recording eight hours of a, a dialogue of book and that's gonna take you a while to do because obviously you're not gonna do it perfectly in one take all from start to finish. And there's gonna be mistakes, stuff like that. They're gonna have to edit out. Um, so because of that, you have to keep in mind that obviously it can take a lot more time than eight hours. I can tell you that much. So just because the book's eight hours doesn't mean it's gonna take that long. Uh, Cause also when you're doing independent narration, uh, not only are you the narrator, but you're the producer and the editor and most of the time also the director. So you have to decide if the narrator, the author you're working with doesn't have a lot of input, then you have to kind of decide how you want to bring the characters to life yourself. So that's how you direct. So you direct the characters. You also do the narration. Uh, as the producer, you have to do the recording. And like, obviously, the editing is the editor. You have to edit the file down, edit out any ed mistakes, stuff like that. Um, so that's all your responsibility. So professional narrators who do it all the time in like the big audiobook studios, obviously, they only have to come in. They have a recording studio that they're given to use. They walk up to the microphone, they record their piece, they walk away, they're done. Everyone does all the other behind the scenes stuff for you. But obviously when you're doing it yourself from home, you're gonna have to do all that yourself. Uh, so that's one thing. So to give you an idea, one hour of recording takes about four hours of editing. So if you have an hour long recording, it's probably gonna take you about four hours to edit that. And I've been doing it for years and I've gotten it down pretty good. Like you'll get fast at it, but it's still gonna take you time. Um, so that's important to keep in mind when getting into it. But the question everyone wants to know, where do you start? Now, in my personal, as I explained, I started out as a, on a podcast with my friend. And by doing that, I kind of got comfortable talking to a microphone. And I decided, well, I can do this narration thing, but where am I gonna start? because I have no idea. So one of the places that the Ewan Morton, from my, the guest from my podcast I talked about earlier said, is LibriVox, LibriVox.org. So LibriVox.org is a website that has volunteers record public domain audiobooks. Now, what's good about this is it gives you the chance to test your fortitude and stamina for recording, because when you're recording and speaking for long periods of time, your voice can get very tired. Obviously your mouth gets dry, lots of other things. Um, but the way this does is any book in the public domain, someone might decide, oh, I, I have this book, or let's say the first thing is a book of poems. So I have this book of poems. I wanna get it recorded in an audio book. Let's get some volunteers to record it. So it's, it's like a message form, essentially how it works. You log into it, you post a message saying, oh, I'll record this poem. Uh, or you might say, I'll record this one or maybe two more after that. And it's a good starting part, point because obviously it's short. So you can kind of test how your voice works. You can, you can learn how to edit because editing a poem is much easier than editing an entire audiobook. 
Um, and it's a good way to just test it. Another one they do is plays. Now, when it comes to plays, the way they do it usually is they'll cast one specific person as a part. So you're going to read a, a public domain play. You're just going to read the lines of this one character. Uh, then you'll submit your lines. And then whoever's in charge of that will put it all together for you. You don't even have to worry about editing it for most of these things because whoever's in charge of the product, uh, the project takes care of all that. You just have to make your sample good to go. Um, they also have short story compilations, uh, similar to the poems. You can record one or you can volunteer to record many if you want to. And it's the way it works is the like first come, first serve basis. So you show up there, you look at who has claimed what, you see what's still available, you say, oh, I'll take that one. They go, okay, you have it. So it's very, it's very easy, very loose like that. Um, and then when it comes to chapter books, they'll usually also assign a chapter per narrator. So like you'll give like, oh, I'll do a chapter. So you record a chapter of whatever that book is, and then you'll submit it, and then it gets edited into a big compilation that they later release for public use. So again, no editing on your part. You just have to worry about editing your part. Just your, just part. your chapter. Yeah. They'll take care of putting it all together in the big audio book. So yeah, so it, like I said, it's a good way to test your skills and learn how to do the editing, where you don't feel as stressed out because it doesn't really matter since you're volunteering to do a public domain book, someone's not relying on income from it. So it's a nice way to kind of like, okay, let's see if this is for me. And that's what I did. I, I did a lot of these. I recorded poems. I did parts and plays. I did plenty of short stories. Like I did a few like Norse mythology stories from a public domain North mythology book. Uh, chapter books, they have plenty of like scientific books or stuff like that, educational books maybe. And there's sometimes like, you know, fiction and stuff like that, but it doesn't pop up as often because we have public domains as it is. Um, so like I said, it's a great way to test your narration fortitude and stamina. So obviously, um, by doing that, you can get practice. And like I said, when I started, I was pretty, it was pretty hard for me to record long periods of time, but I can do it much longer now because, you know, you kind of get the skill and the stamina over time. And that's a good starting point. Um, so now the main way I do audiobooks now is the other thing, which is called ACX. This is the Audiobook Creation Exchange. ACX is owned and operated by Amazon.com. Um, it allows authors to put their books up for narrators to audition for. So as it works is a independent author has a book they want to turn into an audiobook. They go to ACX, they say, okay, this is the book I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, a narrator. So they make a post for the audition. Uh, you go on it after you create your profile in ACX, you, you can put, you know, like a little profile, like a little picture. You can do like demo clips of anything that you've done in the past, so people can listen to it when they when you audition. Um, and so after they do that, they put it up for audition, and you just kind of go searching through it, just like searching through Amazon itself. You just search, and it'll show all the books available for audition, and then you just kind of you can even like cut it down to like, oh, I only want to read science fiction books. So you click science fiction, and it'll show you all the science fiction books available for audition. Now, the way ACX is mostly done is a royalty share deal. Uh, it's a seven year exclusive contract with Audible. So how that works is the author decides I want my book recorded. A narrator auditions and gets hired, records the book and uploads it to ACX. Amazon then takes the files and creates an audiobook that they then sell only on Audible uh, if you do the exclusive contract. And as it's broken down is Amazon gets 50% of the sales, the author gets 25%, and the narrator producer, which is the same because you're doing both parts, it gets 25% as well. So obviously Amazon takes the share of everything, but that's what they're giving you, giving you this platform to be able to do that if you don't really have the resources to get a publisher to make your audiobook for you. Um, this is a, a good way for people to get out there and do that. Um, so you only get money when an audiobook sells a copy. I'll admit, the first two audiobooks I ever recorded on ACX, I don't think they've ever sold a copy. It was a very, like, I was just excited to do it. It was a very weird book, um, but I did it anyway. And I think maybe there's one copy sold. Um, but, but then other stuff I've done, 
you'll it'll just be like, oh, this month you sold 50 audiobooks. Here's a check. And and it just goes into your account and suddenly it's like, oh, I got money. And after you do all the work, it goes on for seven years, which is how the initial thing starts. But if the author decides to keep it going, it'll stay up on there. They'll renew the contract and you'll keep getting paid if it keeps selling. So that's a good way to get a little money here into your account. Uh, the other is per completed hour. Now, how this works, a job per completed hour averages about $100 to $200 per completed hour. What that means is, say, an audiobook is eight hours long, you would get paid eight hours total. Like, it doesn't take into consideration how much time you spend editing and doing all that stuff. That doesn't matter. What only matters is the length of the book in the end, and you get paid based on that. Um, so this is good in the sense that if you get a job like this, you're going to get a nice big check at the end of it. That's it. You'll never see anything else from it. So it's kind of like the royalty deal gives you a little money over time. Like I'm still getting money from books I recorded seven years ago here and there. It's not a huge amount. Obviously, I'm not retired because I work here, but, <laughs> but it's nice to have. Um, so I actually want to give a quick preview of that. Put this website up here. Let me get my screen sharing because I'm going to show you what it looks like. All right, so let me see about switching my screen share. I'm going to end the screen share here real fast. Great. I'm going to share another screen. Bear with me. Yes, put it up on here too. Where's that? Where is this? There it is. It's in there. Yeah. Now it's gone back. Oh, it's, yeah, let me let me just redo that because I didn't move it first. That was my mistake. Order of operations. Gotta do the order of operations. Uh, all right. So we want this screen to share. All right. So as you can see, this here is my profile on audio creation exchange. This is the dashboard. So this is where you can see how many audiobooks you've sold. And I just I'm kind of see if I can hide this or I can't quite see the top. You can drag it down. Can I drag it down? Uh, it's my grab it. Grab it. Uh, it's grab it while it's coming down. Oh, okay. I meant this. Can I close this one? Or just like that. All right. All right. So, as you can see, this is the going in total of audiobooks I have sold in my lifetime. Uh, so this is your sales edge where it's broken down right now. Like this is all I've earned in the last month. So one of my books sold one copy. Um, but let's go to life to date. So you can see these are all the books I have recorded. And the thing with the way Audible works, if you're familiar with the Audible platform, they have memberships that you can subscribe to. And with your membership, you get a member credit. With that credit, you can purchase any audiobook. So the first is AL units. That's if, you, if an Audible person purchases your book with a credit. Because obviously the money amount is different depending on how they do it, because the credit is the last, least amount of money you get, because it's, it's not really a source of money. I don't know exactly how they break it down. The ALOP unit, that is if an Audible member doesn't use a credit, but when you're subscribed to Audible, you can buy it at a discounted rate. So that's the discounted rate if you're a member. And then the last one, the ALC units, that's if someone buys it without a membership whatsoever at full price. So depending on how it sells is how much money you get. Obviously, the price of the audiobook also is usually broken down to how long the audiobook is. Mine are typically, I think, eight hours long. And they, I think, retail at 25 I don't remember the exact amount, but so I usually get like $5 per book sold, depending on if it's a credit or not. Like if it's pure, not discounted, I think it's about five. Everything else goes lower after that. So yeah, so this is where you would go and do stuff. And as this, how the site works, let's see, search here. You go to titles accepting auditions. And so I'll explain here. As you can see there are currently, I have, I have already like a filter set up here, like I do register or per completed hour. Uh, and then you just go and you kind of just look through it and you figure out, okay, what looks good? Like the uprising, that's like a fantasy looking book. I like fantasy books. Let's see what that's about. So you would go down here and you would get information on the book. It gives you like the rating on Amazon. So you can get an idea of how popular the book is. Uh, a lot of the time I try to at least have like 
multiple ratings on it before, because obviously the first book I recorded, as I said, never sold anything and it's never been rated still to this point. So it's a good way to kind of like, okay, maybe this won't take off. Or you can also just get all the information here. You can get the name of the author and it gives you a little bio right here of the author usually. Uh, I know that's the, it does sometimes, but that's just the book, but it gives you the information. You can look up the book. It even has the link right to the Amazon page. If you click on the link. That's a good book. Look at what it says. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, and then you get it like an estimated length. So it's going to be a 13 hour book they estimate. That also depends on how fast to record. Uh, sometimes the estimated amount is a little less or a little more than it ends up being. Um, and that's where you can see it's a, it's a royalty share book. It gives you the word count. It tells you it's an exclusive license. So that's that seven year contract with Amazon specifically, so you know. And that's pretty much all there is to it. And then you just kind of go here where it says audition. You'll see there'll be an audition script. You just hit here, you'll download it. It's usually like a Word document. You'll record whatever snippet they gave you, you know, edit it to the best of your ability. You want to make it sound like your finished product would be. Then you upload it to them. From here, you just hit the browse button, upload it. The author then gets it. And the author gets to decide after that who they want to narrate. And if they decide they like you, then you'll get an email saying you have been selected to record this book, do you accept? So you have one more chance to like say, oh, do I really wanna do this? You do that. Then the next step after that, let me go to, back to my dashboard here. Dashboard. I don't know projects, that's a better way of doing it. All right, there's my face, so you know I'm not lying. <laughs> uh, so, here is like what you'll see we're off like the offers I have gotten. These are all the books I've recorded and have been offered over the time. Sometimes you get blind offers that I didn't accept because like I don't know, like ah, I really like your book. And I looked at them and were like, well, I don't really like your book. So I'm not going to do it. You might feel like, like I said, I did that first book, which I probably is on the last page here. I'll show you it. Uh, this dream weaver book. Uh, this guy I recorded. See, one total sale. And I recorded it in, what did I record it? In 2013. <laughs> so that's why you got to kind of make sure, like, obviously you want to be too picky and choosy because you want to get work, but you also want to make sure it's worth your time because you're going to put a lot of work into this if you're doing a royalty share deal. If it doesn't sell, that work is for nothing. Chris, we have a question online. Oh, sure. So, um, question for the panelists. Do many of these platforms have opportunities for narrations in Spanish? If not, do you do other platforms that offer this? I know when you had the... Oh, yes, there is. Do you show them that? I think I saw something about language one. Yeah, yeah. If you go into the title stuff in auditions, it'll, you can choose what language you speak. Uh, I just chose any because that's what I do. But let's say, like, say Spanish. Yeah, so, we'll apply Spanish. So, these are based on royalty share, mail, or this, these things that I have, these are what's currently available in the Spanish language. So there are opportunities. It all depends on what authors are putting up, obviously. Uh, so it's a great place to start. And then what's good about it is it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, you just use your Amazon login. It's the same login uh, that you use on amazon.com. And you just set up your profile and you just start auditioning. Now here's the thing, what if you agree to do one of these things, and then you don't do it. Well, I guess it depends because there is, or you don't finish it in the in the time frame. Because well, there are time some frame. authors that will give you like a little leeway. Okay. Uh, it depends on how crazy they are or like how specific they are. Uh, like I've had different, like the one I make, like Shuri also, I've been reading a lot of her books. Like she does these werewolf books and she really likes me as an author. And I've read, like most of the books I've read are hers. Uh, so she likes me. So she keeps offering me more books, even without me auditioning. So I just continue reading. Like this is a, the Werewolf Academy is a seven book series I did. And then it's currently, she's doing the seven series and it's up to book three. It's also going to be seven books in the end. So I'm working on that currently. It's a continuation of this series. So she just wanted the same narrator to do all of it. Um, but like, see where it says in production here? Like, this is a book I recorded, but uh, what happened was the author decided not to renew the contract after seven years. And so it kind of just went back to the spot. But this is another one where I was 
gonna read the next book for this guy who did, you know, that Dreamweaver book. And I decided like, I don't really want to do it again, but I had already accepted it. And as you can see, it's still there. And I can literally still work on it because he never took it away. <laughs> but I think the author can terminate a contract if someone doesn't fulfill the contract or like, oh, if you didn't finish it by the date. Um, because like here you'll see in my completed projects, uh, go to the project page here. I think it'll tell you when it was originally, no, like it'll say when it was submitted and when it got published. But it'll say here, if it's not live, it'll say when your date of like when your due date is. So it's always there in the corner so you don't forget. Uh, but yeah, so this is a great way of doing it. Once you figure it out, like I said, do a little bit of work on LibriVox is a good way to get started uh, to feel if you're really, if this is for you. Uh, but then if you want to get into it, you, you go to a site like this. Uh, and like I said, it's really easy to sign up. You make your profile um, and yeah. So that's pretty much all there is to it. And then you just audition. Obviously it got a little more competitive when COVID happened. Because everyone decided, oh, I can join this platform and audition. And so you would think I would have lots of work to do, but it ended up being a, a very difficult. It's a very competitive field. And not a lot of people know about ACX, but it's becoming more popular now, obviously. Um, so it's obvious you're going to be competing with people in that regard. So let me pull this guy back to here. And now I'm going to go back to my slides. Oh, where was I at? All right, ACX. You're that there's a studio here, then? We have a recording studio that we let people use. And you just um, sign up for time? Um, yeah, so you um, you will email Evie Create, like the word create. Amy? E is in Easter, B is in voice, East Brooklyn. Create, C-R-E-A-T-E, at E is in East, B is in Brunswick, P is in public, L is in library. .org. And when you email them, you can ask if you want to reserve a recording studio space. It's typically a two hour window. If there's no one else using the space, you can extend that time. We also try to make sure that because it's a subroom in our maker space, that if you're going to be recording something, you're not just like rehearsing and editing, that that space doesn't have people coming in and running around and running the glow boards and playing guitars or things. Yeah, it's completely free and it's open to garbage. All right. So that was ACX. Now I'm going to go over some other websites. <clears throat> There's another website that's kind of similar to ACX that's recently come around called Find Away Voices. Uh, the difference with this one is um, it doesn't do royalty deals. And you don't actively audition. You create a profile, set up your demo, whatnot, your, your sample clips. And then you say, I'm looking for work. And then the people looking for people will go through the profiles and decide, oh, I want you to try out an audition. So obviously it's, it's, it's a free software, just like uh, ACX, but it becomes like, you just have to play the waiting game and see if you get any kind of offers. Like, oh, audition for my book, please. I like the way your voice sounds. Um, now, if you want to get into less about audiobooks and just general voiceover narration, sorry, just dropped something. Um, so one of the most popular sites is voices.com. The problem with a service like this, I was a part of one, like it costs $500 a year. Uh, so the membership lets you audition, but doesn't guarantee jobs. Cause I was a member of this for several years, never got a single job. Um, that's a very, very competitive market. When you're just free, like doing regular voiceover, like commercial spots, uh, voiceovers in video games, uh, voiceovers in TV shows, or just like web shows, even. Uh, there's lots of stuff like that. Um, so another one is Voices One Two Three. That's it has a tiered membership, so you can get at the lowest tier at one ninety nine a year, or six hundred dollars a year. Now the membership lets you audition. The higher membership gives you a smaller pool of competitors. So if you really want to get into it and pay six hundred a year on that, then I think it's like you compete with only like I think the base one you compete with like fifteen thousand people. The high one you compete with maybe twenty five hundred. So it's still twenty five hundred people you're competing with, and you'll see like lots of professional voice actors use these sites. So you're competing with them. <laughs> So obviously if you want to get into that, that's why audiobook narration was a good gateway for me because I'm like, I realized I don't think this voiceover is going to work 
but I do like the idea of it. Let me see how I can do with audiobooks. And uh, if you get lucky and you get an author that really likes you, they'll keep giving you work, which is nice. And the good thing about her books is, as you saw, they sell decently compared. Like, obviously, they're not going to be New York Times bestsellers, but you know, it's a nice little bit of money. I usually get, I think I average about $100 a month from royalties. So like I said, I'm not gonna survive on it, but it's nice to have that little extra money. Um, so advice, apart from what I've already said, one more thing is take care of your voice. Your voice is your money. So you gotta make sure you do things like, for instance, before you record, drink hot tea with lemon. It helps relax your throat muscles, clears out that like, <clears throat> you know, that phlegmy feeling in the back of your throat, makes your voice sound super clear. It's really, like, it's really weird. Like when I first got my condenser microphone, I record myself and I listen to myself without anything. But then if I drink some hot tea with lemon, then record <laughs> myself, the sound, the clarity of my voice is just so much better. Like it's amazing what that little thing can do. Uh, Obviously avoid sugary beverages like juice and soda on recording days because sugary beverages introduce that awful mouth noise, smacky sound that you get. You don't want that in your recordings. Um, always warm up your voice before recording. I know it kind of sounds silly, but warming up your voice is important. And there's plenty of vocal exercises. One of my favorites, I sit there in my microphone, I sit down, I put my headset on, I'm just like, Red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. And then to work on sibilance, you do the old she cells, seashells by the seashore. Because you know, if you have that harsh S sound, you know you want to kind of cut down on that. And doing that a few times, you can remember, remind yourself, don't do this. It's like, so I'm like, she sells, seashells, but that's harsh. You want she sells seashells by the seashore and just do that a few times warm up your voice like that and then for the plosives the old peter piper picked a pack of pickled peppers peter piper picked a pack of pickled peppers so do that it's good to do it before you record um always have a glass of water at room temperature i know it's tempting to not have a nice ice cold glass of water you don't want ice cold it's bad for the throat so Stick to room temperature. It'll help, you know, keep you from dehydrating and your voice getting all that dry mouth feeling. Always take breaks. Feel free to do it in the middle of recording. What I do essentially, I'm recording a book. I read a paragraph and I'm going to say, okay, I really need a drink. You don't even stop the recording. You just pick up the drink, you drink it. And then you can make like a sound like snap your finger or something because that'll pop up on the recording. So, you know, like a sharp, like descend in like the time or the sound like a sharp sound you can see it visibly so you know okay i need to fix that i'll edit that out so it's a good way if you like recording another thing you do is when recording obviously if you do make mistakes you flub a line just go back and say it again and say it again until you feel like you got it right stopping the recording could like take up a lot of time obviously if you do it that way though you'll have less to edit later because if you like stop it go back because there's a there's a method that's essentially um, what it does is you record it and then you hit a button and it'll go back in time a little bit in the recording it'll play what you recorded first and then it'll start recording again so if you do it that way you can kind of hear how your voice sounded so you don't lose that consistency because obviously that's the other thing if you're doing recordings I always recommend at least finishing the chapter you're working on. Um, don't ever like read half a chapter and go, oh, I'll finish this later, because when you go back and record it, your voice isn't going to sound the same. Like it's going to like, and you're going to have to like try to get that, capture that same vibe again. So it's always good to just commit to a chapter. That's usually what I do. Like I'm going to record one chapter tonight. After I record that chapter, I'm going to see, do I want to record another one? I'm like, sure. I feel like I can. Let me go to another one. And don't even worry about editing, just record. And then what I do is I go back at all the chapters I've recorded and then I'll be like, okay, today's an editing day so you can rest your voice. Good idea to always do that. Always have off days so you can rest your voice. Cause if you're just going nonstop, I've done that in the past and you do start to lose your voice. Like, and you don't want that to happen. Especially if you have a deadline. Uh, Voices can be fun to use, but don't wreck your voice. I personally am a big fan of trying to give all the characters a unique voice. Not every, it's not a requirement, but it does make 
it more interesting and fun for someone to listen to because it's more like a play or you're like, and you can differentiate between the characters and like, you feel like you get to know them better because they have a little more personality. Like it's fun. Like, like, as you mentioned earlier, like Jim Dale, he's one of the, he's the one who records the Harry Potter books. He's like in the Guinness throw Guinness book of world records for the most individual voices, like unique voices for every character does not use the same voice twice. <laughs> If you can do that, more power to you, but don't do voices that are gonna wreck your throat. Like, um, I always go back to, it's an old cartoon when I was a kid called Inspector Gadget, if you're familiar with it. And like Dr. Claw, you know, it's like, I'll get you next time, Gadget. Like, obviously that's a sun sounding voice, but that's gonna kill your voice if you do it too much. <laughs> like, obviously over time, you're gonna learn how to use your voice like that and you'll be able to do it. But I think, one thing to, important thing to note is subtlety goes a long way. Even if you just alter your voice subtly a little bit, like maybe your cadence is a little slower for this character, but you don't necessarily change the voice. Well, yeah, this guy who talks like this, and it's like, hey, I'm, not, I'm like, I got a lot of energy. I don't know what you're talking about. You know? the, so a little subtly, yeah, it's the same voice. I'm not changing my voice. I'm just changing the tempo or the cadence to differentiate between characters. A lot of narrators will just do, oh, two people are talking, they'll alter the two voices so you know someone else is talking, but they won't give them unique voices, and that works perfectly fine, obviously. Just do what you can do. There's no reason to be like, I have to do as many voices as I can if you can't do it. Uh, plenty of people do it without voices. Like I said, just that subtle change in your voice can be all you need. But yeah, don't do it to the point where you wreck your voice. I've done that few voices like that myself. So mouth noise, that thing I was talking about earlier, I just did it. You hear that? That smacking sound? It's because I've been talking a lot, and that's what happens when you talk a lot. Your voice starts to get that dry, and I guess that smacky sound. Now, one of the things I do before I record, a good thing to have, if you have on hand, very simple thing to have, just chew on a stick of gum before you record, even if it's like a minute. Chew on the gum for a minute. You can even put it off to the side in the wrapper in case you want to, like, take a break later, like, let me renew and like put the gum back in your mouth, chew it a little bit more. What that's gonna do is it's gonna moisten the mouth because you have something in it, but you're not eating per se. So you don't have to worry about that. And it does cut down on mouth noise considerably. Uh, obviously, if you're doing gum, preferably sugar-free, because like I said, sugar is not good for your voice. Um, another option, if you don't wanna do gum, apple slices. If you like apples, just a couple slices of apples, eat a couple apple slices, same thing, it'll get rid of that mouth noise. <laughs> and obviously, as I mentioned earlier, your sibilants and plosives, I explained. Your S's can't be harsh, your, your P's can't have too much air pushing out of them, because they would be picked up in your recordings. And no matter how much post-processing you do on them, you really can't ever get rid of them. So most of the time you'll have to re-record it if it's that bad. Occasionally, you're gonna get a plosive, and it might not be a bad plosive or a sibilant thing. Just obviously, people who listen to your book, it does get grating to them, even if they don't think it does. But it's like, oh, but the P's are exploding so powerful. So always just keep an eye on that. Like I said, seashell, she sells seashells by the seashore, and Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Do that a few times, kind of get your P's and the S's in, in order, and you'll be good. Um, Obviously take frequent breaks. Um, if you're gonna be recording, like, like I said, I've recorded, I typically record one chapter in one session, but if I'm feeling up to it, I'll go up to two. Depends on the length too. If it's a long chapter, just like keep that in mind if you're gonna to go to a next one. Like that's another thing I can actually say. When you do have a book that you're gonna record, I recommend just reading the whole thing before you do the recording. Now that's for many reasons. It's good to know the direction of the story and the characters. So if you want to give them a personality or something that meshes or because you don't want to record a book, get all the way to the end. And then all of a sudden the author says at the end, he said in his Irish accent, oh, crap. <laughs> he's Irish. Uh, so if you are doing voices like that, keep that in mind. Uh, but yeah, frequent breaks are good. Uh, you can do, I think I would say for every four hours you record, Take like an hour break. Um, that's all depends on how long you can pace it. Like I said, it takes a lot of stamina and obviously vocal power to keep going for too long. You wanna make sure you don't burn yourself out because if you burn yourself out, you can lose your voice for several days. And that's 
time wasted and lost if you, like I said, have a deadline. So uh, yeah, marathon sessions can wreck your voice. Um, get used to the sound of your own voice because you're going to hear it a lot, especially if you're going to be doing the editing yourself, like doing the ACX platform. Uh, I, I've heard many people like, oh, I hate the sound of my own voice. And like, but then they've also said, oh, I'd love to be an audiobook narrator. I'm like, well, if you, if you want to be a narrator that gets brought into a studio by a producer and a director who tells you what to do and then you walk out, sure, you're fine, but you're not going to get that right off the bat. So it's, if you're going to do it, you're going to listen, get used to the sound of your own voice. And it's, it's funny, I could go back to like old sound clips, like of my old books I've recorded, and I could be like, oh my God, I sound awful. And I, because I've gotten, like, I've improved over time. Like, I record much better. I have better equipment. And I'm like, I wish I could record that book again, but not can. It's done. <laughs> so, to make sure you're going to hear it a lot. Yeah. And uh, side effects may include lots of talking to yourself. I found since I've started doing audiobook narration, I will talk to myself a lot in a room by myself because it's what you're used to doing. You know, because you're reading someone's book and you're talking out loud so often that you just feel like you have to keep doing that. Uh, like, I don't do it too often, but every once in a while, I'll just find myself and my wife will be like, what do you want? I'm like, oh, and I'm not talking to you. It's like, who are you talking to? I'm like, just myself, I guess. <laughs> It's good to know the sound of your own voice because you're going to need to know, like, as you're recording, you'll have your, like, studio headset on. Typically, interfaces have a studio headset port, which is usually a, a, a quarter inch. It's important to note studio headset because when it comes to headphones, um, if you buy the Beats by Dre, the way those guys work is they have equalizing done in the headset itself. So there is processing of the sound going on in the headphones before it hits your ears. Studio headphones is the pure audio the way it sounds. It doesn't have any processing whatsoever, so you are going to hear it the way it is, and that will allow you to be like, okay, this is how I adjust that to get rid of the room noise. Whatever you got to do. Um, and so so just keep that in mind. So, yeah, when you listen to your headset, you're going to hear your voice a lot. Everyone says you're going to hear the microphone. You are going to hear your voice in your ear. And you are going to get to the point where you know you flubbed a line and re-record the line anyway. Even if it's just like a subtle thing, you'll notice it because you were so used to hearing the sound of your own voice. Oh, I fumbled that line. And when you go back to check the recording, you will see, yeah, yeah I did fumble that line. So you were going to get used to that. So that's pretty much it.